Hello everybody. Hello YouTube. Hello art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M. And I'm back with yet another video. Uh, today, gonna have another cup of coffee. Gonna have another cup of coffee because I feel like it. And <laughs> I feel like discussing a couple of things from my Google Alerts. This is um, you know, the latest, the latest that I, 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 like I said, my Google alerts are The Shining, Stanley Kubrick, David Lynch, Art Crimes, and what else? Can't, oh, Hunter Biden's art. Not Hunter Biden's scandal, no, just Hunter Biden's art. Nothing. Nothing. I, all I keep, all I keep getting email alerts about is that damn laptop. I can't, I can't take it anymore. I said art. I want to, I want to see the art. Nope. They, no. No, just no. But anyway, so here I am again, y'all. Here I am again. I, I, I'm I doing this video the same night that I did this one. It's So it's pretty new. It's only got one view after 51 minutes. So yeah, this one's not going to do very well. Uh, but I'll keep doing them because I feel like it. A painting, Edward Monk's Anxiety. Again, check it out if you haven't already. I kind of want to make this a thing. I want to like do as many uh, as I possibly can do. I might, you know, again, if I have the time, energy, patience, strength, whatever, I might want to turn this thing into like a daily thing, like a painting a day or an artwork a day or whatever. So I really would appreciate, especially my regulars, I would appreciate you guys' uh, suggestions or requests for what you want me to see and, you know, look at and react to as far as artwork, paintings go. Um, so that's that. Let me do my church announcements before I get into it. Once again, this is a coffee break. Get you some coffee, get, or whatever you like to drink. It's none of my business. Uh, get comfortable or, you know, listen to me while you're doing your chores. Uh, I wish I had something to listen to today. I was mowing the lawn, y'all. I've never mowed a lawn in my life, but today was the day and I got, <laughs> I, I got a, um, electric, electric. It's plugged into the electricity. Um, lawnmower and you know i think i did okay especially for someone who's never mowed a lawn before because that's not what we do i'm female we don't do that shit okay <laughs> women don't mow lawns but i did today boy howdy um anyway so let me get into um let me do this church announcements and then let me get into what i want to get into for this video um returning viewers thank you for returning new viewers thank you for being new subscribers thank you for subscribing all 517 of you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you for being here for subscribing for for giving a damn as as to what i have to say i i appreciate that so much please don't forget to like comment subscribe and share the videos if you enjoy them and if you know anybody who might also enjoy them you know let get that link and put it wherever um <laughs> <laughs> and that's it that's that's it for my church announcement so before i get started with my google alerts um foolery i want to alert you to my friend uh here on this platform uh tankard of tales he's got a new video out it's a long one okay i'm a bad influence ain't i um <laughs> So his latest video, I think just, yeah, it says three hours ago it dropped the untankered episode Mind Games and The Shining. I, for one, cannot wait to get into this video. I'm going to probably watch it like right after I'm done with my own nonsense over here making my own video. But you all check out Tankard. Um, subscribe. I'm subscribed. I'm subscribed and my bell is, is rung over here. Um, so you know, check out all of his stuff, watch all of his videos. I, I think I have. And if, you know, if it, I've, I've watched a lot of your videos, Tankard. Um, I even know about the mellow yellow. So, you know, that, that should tell you <laughs> that I, that I, that I'm a fan. So check it out. I can't wait to check it out. Can't wait to drop one of my own comments under, under Tankard's videos. Uh, I can't wait to see what he has to say about what he's, you know, doing the video about. So you all, now that um, I got the church announcements out the way, shouted out my friend Tankard. Now let me get into it. What do I want to talk about today? Oof, listen, I had a headache, maybe because I spent all that time in the sun today mowing the damn lawn. And that was after I came home from the gym and spent, 
over an hour on the on the damn elliptical trainer and then oh oh my uh, let me tell you i'm tired but um this damn thing i've done videos about this fool before mr bank c okay a street artist unveils new glasgow exhibition cut and run the name of the exhibition is cut and run and you know oh yeah that's the last category of my google alerts um the one that i couldn't remember art crimes guess where i f yeah that's where i found this the google alerts for art crimes brought this up so i said oh shit not him again so here it is the solo show cut and run taking place at the city's gallery of modern art g-o-m-a goma uh, has been officially authorized by the elusive street artist. It spans 25 years and will feature many of the stencils he has used to create his work. I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn about him or his work. Um, mm -mm. No, I, th again, this is to me just another example of something hiding in plain sight, like I was talking about in this video the other day, the coffee break video from about a day ago. What's hiding in plain sight? In this case, I think it's money laundering. But that's just me. That's my opinion, okay? I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an investigator. I'm just a spectator with an opinion, okay? Banksy told the Herald, I've kept these stencils hidden away for years, mindful they could be used as evidence in a charge of criminal. <laughs> Damn it, that's why it was in art crimes. Lord, it didn't, hmm, nobody cares. You named your exhibit Cut and Run. That's what you're doing. Okay, that's what you're doing. Or the people who run you. That's what they're doing, Banksy. But at the moment, I'm now, I'm not sure which is, what? But that moment seems to have passed. Oh, so, oh, I see. Now you're no longer a vandal. Just, just a common vandal. No, now, now you're an artist. Okay, so now I'm exhibiting them in a gallery as works of art. I'm not sure which is the greater crime. Your whole career is a crime. That's that's what's going on. The artist said the traffic cone, which famously sits on the head of the Duke of Wellington statue outside the gallery, was what threw him to exhibit, what drew him, not threw him, sorry. Maybe that's just a Freudian slip on my part. Uh, drew him to exhibit there. Mm-hmm. Oh, so somebody spoke to him, so that means they know who he is. Oh, dear. A gallery label for the show set for anyone who isn't aware the statue out the front has had a cone on its head continuously for the past 40-odd years, despite the best efforts of the council and police. Every time one is removed, another takes its place. Well, okay. Uh, this might sound... Oh, who cares? Okay, anyway, there's the... Why don't they say what it's a statue of? It's obviously an equestrian statue. Ah, oh, equestrian statues. More, what, what were we talking about? I think me and Gershom were talking about this. Um, it's about legitimizing rule. So equestrian statues have a great deal to do with uh, imagery that has to do with kingship, leadership, whatever. And that's outside this museum that looks an awful lot like a Greek temple, don't you think? Don't you think? Banksy cut and run. Oh, I don't know if this is ironic or just disgusting. I, I, I don't know what to think, but that's about all I'm going to say about this. wanted to bring it to your attention again because I've done videos about this <sighs> character in the past. So, you know, look them up. They're on my channel. They're in there. Go ahead and find them. And then I got a couple, again, from Far Out magazine. Far Out, these people don't sleep. When it comes to Stanley Kubrick and, and all things Kubrickian. Okay, so I got two articles from Far Out. Uh, music, the secret message to Stanley Kubrick hidden in a classic Roger Waters song. Okay. I think I had a commenter the other day who, I can't recall because it's a relatively new commenter, talking about something to do with music and, and, and The Shining. Was it this? I'm going to have to check again, but... Uh, I'll get to it. And then Far Out Magazine again. Stanley Kubrick breaks down his revolutionary approach to lighting in Barry Lyndon. Okay, listen. I'm going to do this one first because I'm not really that interested in this, but I thought maybe you all would be, so I wanted to bring it to your attention. This is from yesterday. 
uh, 15th of June, uh, throughout their time at the top, Pink Floyd existed as one of the most inspired boundary-pushing groups on the planet, relentlessly dedicated to innovation. Uh, as masters in using the studio as an instrument, which fell in tandem with their undoubted talent and foresight, the band pulled together to create truly inspired music, whether it be their psychedelic debut album, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, the 1973 masterpiece The Dark Side of the Moon, or 1979's deeply political commentary, The Wall. Uh, again, this is about a message to not from, to Stanley Kubrick, hidden in a classic Roger Waters song. One familiar aspect of their artistry is that Pink Floyd's creative director, Roger Waters, had the propensity to include secret messages that were hidden within their songs, Sometime, something he continued in his career away from the band. One such moment in his solo chapter featured a reference to an iconic Stanley Kubrick movie and a message to the director himself. Speaking to Rockline in 1993 following the release of his third studio album, Amused to Death, fans called in and quizzed the musician on various topics. At the end of the conversation, Waters revealed how he referred, I'm sorry, how he referenced Kubrick's widely influential science fiction epic 2001 A Space Odyssey in the third track on the album uh, Perfect Sense Part 1. On reflection, of course, this was an immensely ironic moment, given that it is well known that Pink Floyd refused the auteur permission to use Adam Hart Mother as part of his now-famed uh, movie, A Clockwork Orange. What? Oh, the nerve. Oh, the audacity. Oh, okay. All right. I, I, how could you ever refuse Stanley Kubrick anything? But whatever. Uh, per the account of the band's drummer Nick Mason in a 2018 interview with Uncut, this was probably because he wouldn't let us do anything for 2001. Oh, I see. So it was motivated by spite. Okay. As what goes around comes around, when Waters asked Kubrick to use a snippet from 2001 in Perfect Sense Part 1, he was denied, as he should have been. Oof. Again, I, I just don't know what to think about this. I've never been a huge fan of Pink Floyd. I just let you know. Um, it's not my thing. But I know it's I know a lot of people love them. I'm trying to figure out why. I mean I've heard their songs before, like on the radio and what have you. But it was never something that really, really intrigued me to the point where I just had to run out and buy an album or you know, no. No. Um, but, you know, whatever. Uh, okay. He was denied. Okay. As a result, Waters needed to record his own version of the snippet that he wanted from the film, adding weight to the Kubrick connection. The song's opening also references 2001 with the line, The monkey sat on a pile of stones and stared at the broken bone in his hand. Okay. Speaking to Rockline, Waters replied, Okay, all right. Well, well done. A number of people know that I often put messages on records that I make. There's one on the wall and a few other bits. And over that particular piece of Perfect Sense Part 1, we had a bit from 2001. You know, the Kubrick movie. The bit where Dave is turning off HAL 9000, the HAL 9000 computer. And the computer is saying, Stop, Dave. I don't know if you remember it, and there's all this breathing in the background. It's a great scene, and it's been sampled and used on a million different rap records, revealing that this reference was ballasted by a message to Stanley Kubrick, the former Pink Floyd man continued. Anyway, I stupidly asked Stanley Kubrick for permission to use it as background on that particular track. He hemmed and hawed for ages and ages and eventually refused me permission to use it on the grounds that it would open the floodgates and lots of other people would use it. As my presumption is that he was closing the stable door to those who bolted and fell on deaf ears. So I made my own, which is why you've got me breathing on there, which is a bit like that thing, and that is a backwards message for Stanley Kubrick. So, uh, yell nuts backwards, we all, uh, we all now know is Stanley. Oh, God. 
And I, here, here I was thinking this was going to be an interesting article. Oh, th th my opinion, just my opinion. I'm, I'm not into this. Uh, since then, Waters has used the real audio of Hal's sen sentience being removed during the introduction of Perfect Sense Part 1 in the live setting, such as on the In the Flesh tour of 2002, which arrived three years after Stanley Kubrick had passed away in 1999. Listen to Perfect Sense Part 1 below. So every oh my god, like... So, so you, you just, oh, so this is, this is a very like Stephen King kind of move. Like he didn't want you, you knew that he didn't want you to use it. And then the second he died, or well, maybe not the second he died, but like shortly after he died, you did what you originally wanted to do. Dude, like, you know, that makes you look like a jerk, right? At least, I mean, if somebody told me and I knew how they felt like, yeah, I just wouldn't do it. I just, even even after they're dead, I would be like, you know what? Yeah, no, I'm not gonna disrespect somebody like that and 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 do the exact opposite of what they said to do or go against their wishes. Like, ooh. See, I again, I don't know Pink Floyd. I know they have some diehard fans. I I really don't care. I really don't care. Bad behavior is bad behavior. I don't care if you're allegedly a legend. A legend. Oh, God. But, okay, so I got through this article. Thanks, Google Alerts. Um, here's another one, which I want to talk about because it has to do with, as it says here, uh, Stanley Kubrick breaks down his revolutionary approach to lighting in Barry Lyndon. And because I talk about lights so much in connection with Stanley Kubrick, specifically The Shining, because that's the one I'm obsessed with, but you know, his other films too. He's, he's, he's probably using light in revolutionary ways, um, in his other movies. This is why this article kind of intrigues me. I'll go ahead and at least skim it for you after my own coffee break. So sit tight. I'll be right back. All right. I'm back. And I'm going to, I don't know if I'm really going to get into this article. Because, it, oh, well, maybe it's not that long, so I'll go ahead and read it to you. Why not? Again, from far out, Stanley Kubrick breaks, breaks down his revolutionary approach to lighting in Barry Lyndon. At the end of the day, Hollywood is a business, with some filmmakers coming on to set each day, rightfully just after their paycheck. But for others, the artistic medium of cinema is a space to constantly innovate with such minds as Martin Scorsese, Quentin Tarantino, Denis Villeneuve, uh, David Lynch, and Stanley Kubrick, innovating the contemporary moving image with each and every new film they release. Kubrick was particularly enthusiastic in this field, with releasing 14 movies throughout his celebrated career, with each one elevating his style and form. His first considerable success came in 1957 with the release of the war drama Paths of Glory, a gloriously shot monochrome drama that features one of cinema's greatest single tracking shots, with Kubrick following Kirk Douglas's uh, Colonel Dax, as he marches through his army's trenches. Years later, in 1968, he would revolutionize the contemporary science fiction genre with the release of 2001 A Space Odyssey, a phenomenal technical achievement that brought the oddities of the outer cosmos to life through models and ingenious camera techniques. To this day, the film is considered an exemplary piece of science fiction, inspiring countless directors jealous of its technical and narrative scope. Though one of Kubrick's most understated technical achievements was his approach to lighting in 1975's Barry Lyndon, a period drama that has long gone under the radar as one of the director's greatest movies. In the film, which follows an Irish rogue who cheats his way into autocracy, Kubrick uses natural lighting to frame each and every moment, utilizing the sun outside and candlelight indoors. And I'm, I'm once again, I'm interested in this because of my kind of fixation on light with regard to The Shining that I haven't really explored very much yet, but I think that his use of light is extremely important. 
in all of his films. Um, again, what is he trying to say? What is going on with his use of light? Is it more references to mythology? Is it um, him, you know, showing you little clues as to what he's really doing? You know, again, possibly my little uh, think, uh, feeling about this, you know, natural light equals truth, false light equals lies, possibly, I'm not sure, but whatever. Uh, speaking about his love of natural light, Kubrick stated in an interview with Michael Cement, I have always tried to light my films to simulate natural light, in the daytime using the windows actually to light the set, and in night scenes the practical uh, lights you see in the set. This approach has its problems when you can use bright electric light sources, but when candelabras and oil lamps are the brightest light sources which can be in the set, the difficulties are vastly increased. The solution to the technical issue came with the director's discovery of a new lens, explaining, Prior to Barry L Lyndon, the problem has never been properly solved. Even if the director and cameraman had the desire to light with practical light sources, the film and the lenses were not fast enough to get an exposure. Fortunately, I found just such a lens, one of a group of ten which Zeiss had specially manufactured for NASA satellite photography. And I know I'm going to get comments about, you know, whether or not he, he did the moon landing. Oh, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> the new lens allowed Kubrick to shoot in very low light, producing some truly spectacular moments of atmospheric cinema that challenged how such industry practices were performed in the future. For the day interior scenes, we used either the real daylight from the windows or simulated daylight by banking lights outside the windows and dif diffusing them with tracing paper taped on the glass. Kubrick explains, breaking down the exactness of how he carried out his process. He adds, in addition to the very beautiful lighting you can achieve this way, it is also a very practical way to work. You don't have to worry about shooting into your lighting equipment. All your lighting is outside the window behind tracing paper, and if you shoot towards the window, you get a very beautiful and realistic flare effect. Did he also use this in The Shining? And, and specifically, I'm thinking about the Colorado lounge scenes, because there are moments in the Colorado lounge in the daytime scenes, especially like the big showdown between um, Jack and Wendy, where there's like this this brightness that's coming through those windows. Uh, something's going on. Something in that scene, and specifically the way it's lit from the quote-unquote natural light coming through the windows in the Colorado Lounge, that makes me rethink some stuff. Or maybe not rethink some stuff, some of the stuff that I'm actually thinking about right now. Right this very second, the wheels are turning in my head. It actually reinforces what I already believe, but at the same time, I've got stuff to think about now. Thanks to this article, again, he's he was obsessed with capturing natural light. Again, is that because to him, natural light uh, is the truth, right? I don't know. I don't know. And so that's that article. So I've, I've covered Cut and Run, Mr. Cut and Run Banksy. This one, uh, it's another person that you would think would maybe know better because he's so respected, but he also seems to have uh, just had this negative relationship with Stanley Kubrick and, and went against his wishes after he died. I'm not cool with that, personally. And then this article about how he uses light in Barry Lyndon. And then this. Okay. Um, I found this, again, at Google Alerts. And um, this is about, you know, just that Hollywood is a dark, mysterious, scary, dangerous place. And the reason I bring this up is because um, this has been making the rounds lately on Twitter and stuff like that. Um, 
I'm not going to click on that image, not going to, mm -mm, no, but I wanted to talk about something that they repeat here, okay? This damn rumor, basically. Tankard has done videos about this. Go ahead and scroll down and find them. He, he did a pretty good video debunking the very thing that's being talked about in this latest or, or recent BuzzFeed article. <clears throat> this is number five on their list here. Another horribly mistreated actor with Shelley Duvall in The Shining. Allegedly. I don't believe it. It's been reported that director Stanley Kubrick refused to praise her work and intentionally isolated her from the crew, but this hasn't been confirmed. But people repeat it over and over and over again like it's the gospel. I don't know why. I really don't know why. Um, Co-star Jack Nicholson admitted that Kubrick was an entirely different director with Duvall, and Duvall herself said Kubrick could be pretty cruel and called filming almost unbearable. Okay. Yeah, but did she say that basically Stanley Kubrick tortured her? I haven't seen it. I, Tankard has done a pretty good rundown of this issue. No. No, it, it just doesn't doesn't make sense. Who is putting this out? And and who is... Who, who, who? Because these are not Shelley Duvall's own words. She's not the one who said that he mistreated her. If she, she said he, he could be pretty cruel, she still that still isn't her saying he treated me badly. No, that's just that, you know, her job on this movie was a difficult one. Um, and she put in maybe one of the best performances of her life in this movie. I don't know. Uh, it says here she actually ended up having health issues due to the stress, to the point where her hair fell out in clumps. My hair falls out every day. I'm still not bald. I, I mean, but that happens when you comb your hair. Um, in Vivian Kubrick's documentary, Making the Shining, when Duvall shows the clumps of her hair to Kubrick, he walks away and tells crew members, don't sympathize with Shelley. Have these people never heard of sarcasm? Have they, do they like not know about jokes? I don't know. He also made her perform the emotionally draining baseball bat scene 127 times to the point where she had wounds on her hands from clutching it and didn't tell her what was going on in the scene or what to expect. Wait a minute, I thought that was debunked too. Wasn't it the, the Uncritch book that debunked the, this claim that they did 127 take or something like that? I, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I'm not, I haven't been really keeping track of that, but something tells me that people have been talking about that lately um, in various places and like... A lot of these rumors and myths uh, about Stanley Kubrick and the way he treated people or whatever are, in some cases, just turning out to be flat-out lies. I want to know who's putting this out there. Like, what's the origin of this, these, this stuff? If it's who I think it is, ooh, you know how I feel about him. You know, Stevie the Snowman. But whatever. Um... And this is actually, this is interesting. This is from the very thing that I was talking about a little while ago. I didn't read this before I showed it to you. But um, this is that Colorado lounge scene. The showdown with the baseball bat. Look at the lighting in this room. This is something. This is really quite something. But I'll get to that when I get to that. But I, I wanted to mention this briefly because, first of all, it was in my Google Alerts. I thought it was interesting. And I am sick and tired of people speaking for Shelley Duvall. I'm sick and tired of it. Like, all these people claim to be feminists and claim to, be, you know, care about her and her health and her mental health and whatever. But, like, why don't they go and ask her? Why doesn't, she, you know, why don't any of these people try to reach out to her and say, okay, listen, Shelley, everybody wants to know, was Stanley Kubrick a monster uh, on the set like everybody says he's been, he was to you and whatever? I, until I see that and until I see her respond to that question, I'm not going to take any of this seriously. 
I'm just not. Um, Mm. This 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 is really getting on my last nerve. Uh and I, I'm I'm sick and tired of people either stretching the truth, exaggerating, or just flat out lying, it seems like. So y'all, let me know what you think in the comments regarding this, or regarding this, or regarding this, or this. Um, and again, check out Tankard's new video. I'm going to start watching it right right away when I get done with this. And while I'm here, y'all, while I'm here, um, I finally watched <laughs> Season 1, Episode 2 of Twin Peaks. And I have, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hopefully in the next couple of days or whatever do the Season 1, Episode 2 Unraveling the Mystery of Twin Peaks video. But as I was watching last night, you know, just this is just like a little comment for this video because I've been working on the Twin Peaks stuff and I'm excited about it. Can't wait to like finally really do it. Um, but the Laura Palmer character, she's the victim. She's the murder victim in this movie. And I guess when you watch the show, the first impulse is to sympathize with her and feel sorry for her and whatever. And I do. I do because of the way she died and, and the circumstances surrounding her death. But at the same time, I, I'm, I'm having like weird kind of reactions that I didn't expect to have to this show. Like I'm, I'm kind of starting to like not like her. I'm, I yeah I know that sounds insane, but I'm kind of starting to not like Laura Palmer. I will get into it when I do my season one episode two video under unraveling the mystery of Twin Peaks, who really killed Laura Palmer. Uh, I'll get to it when I get to it. But y'all, I've got so many videos that I want to do, so I'm trying to I'm trying to like do that. I'm trying to be on that. Um, so y'all, I I'm done. <laughs> with his video miraculously it, uh, we're not even close to one hour i don't know how that happened but you i hope you enjoyed this um i'm gonna try to do more frequent coffee breaks and and what have you uh and more frequent art videos and uh, again i'm going to continue with the shining and twin peaks hopefully i'll get to full metal jacket soon too <sighs> I'll figure it out. But anyway, you all, thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscribing. And please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you know somebody who would enjoy this. And that's about it for today's un cafecito, uh, <laughs> coffee break. So, y'all, until next time, until my next video, where I find yet another reason to talk at you, I will go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So, bye-bye, everybody.